Very good morning to you. Last time I finished the section four, electric and magnetic measurement of the electric activity of the brain. Today I start with section five, electric and magnetic measurement of the electric activity of the heart. I start with the 12 lead ECG system and about the generation of the ECG signal. The 12 lead system is the standard electrocardiographic recording method which has developed uh, uh, during the history if uh, everything would be forgotten what has been done and everything would be abandoned what is uh, used in ECG and a new standard lead system should be developed. I am quite sure it would not be the 12 lead system. But for historical reasons it is today the standard lead system which I've already discussed it but I just repeat it here and I come to more to the details. It uh, is composed from the three Eindhoven limb leads, V1, V2 and V3. It has a Wilson leads uh, VR, VL, VF, but they are augmented and called Goldberger augmented leads, AVR, AVL and AVF. I will tell in detail soon what they are. And then the precordial leads on the surface of the chest, V1 to V6. I start with the limb leads. Augustus Waller was a pioneer in electrocardiography. He made his uh, uh, seminal work on ECG with his uh, pet dog, Jimmy. Here is uh, the ECG recorded from Jimmy. It is recorded with a capillary electrometer because uh, uh, that was the most sensitive device at that time. So you see that uh, uh, it was used uh, two vessels having sodium chloride where Jimmy placed its, uh, or should we say his or its, his uh, left front and left rear legs. And this signal was taken to the capillary electrometer. This is an interesting picture about the demonstration of to the Royal Society by Waller's pet bulldog Jimmy, shown in Illustrated London News. So it raised a lot of interest in, in the scientific community, first in, in England and then all around the world. Well, there was a lot of speculation whether this was a cruel experiment uh, because a dog, was, uh, dog had to stand in, in salt water, but what Waller said that if you go just go to the beach on the seaside and, and stand in the, in the sea water, it is just exactly the same. There's uh, sodium chloride in the sea water as well. Augustus Waller made this uh, famous uh, study picture which I, I have shown you several times and I will show it to you m several times more. It is an illustration of the uh, distribution of electric potential on the surface of the chest due to the electric activ activation of the heart and heart is uh, sketched with a thick line and those uh, th thin lines are show the isopotential surfaces. This illustration proves that the cardiac source is a dipolar source. It is true that the heart is very dipolar uh, and uh, because it is uh, recorded rather far away from the source, not very far away but rather far away, it still further emphasizes the dipolar nature of the source. 
Wilhelm Eindhoven was the father of clinical electrocardiology. He received in 1924 Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine for his discovery of the mechanism of the electrocardiogram. Here is shown Eindhoven himself as an experimental person and it is shown how the electrocardiogram was measured during Eindhoven's time. The instrument which was used was a string galvanometer. Eindhoven did not himself invent the string galvanometer, but he improved it. I show it to you in more detail. But here you see clearly why the Eindhoven limb leads are used or were used and still are used, uh, why the ECG was recorded already in the first experiments from two hands and one leg. The reason is simple. Because the string galvanometer <coughs> uh, was not too sensitive instrument, uh, it needed as much electric current from the body, from the electric activity of the heart as possible. Therefore, the contact impedance in the uh, uh, electrodes should be as small as possible and it was made small in the way that it was used such vessels including uh, or filled by sodium chloride solution and the hand, hands were placed to these vessels similarly the left leg. So this was the way to get a good very uh, low contact impedance to the body. So just very practical issue. In the string galvanometer, I show it in, in, in uh, some more il uh, illustrations on that, you first see that there are some selection connectors here. They are quite uh, large in size. They are like today the, the high voltage instruments, uh, powers, electric power systems have this kind of switches, quite big ones. Uh, this is here the string galvanometer uh, instrument itself. The string is here. I show you it uh, in some later slides. Here, just behind the head of the uh, patient, you see a very bright light source, an arc lamp. And the light is uh, uh, going through mirrors, uh, a lens system going through this string galvanometer and going here on the left to this film. There is photographic film running here and the shade of the string galvanometer wire is recorded. It, uh, wire is moving due to the electric uh, current from the body and so it is amplified the movement of the wire uh, by light so it does not have any, any, uh, any uh, uh, mechanical pointer. Here is some other picture about the uh, galvanometer. It was a Cambridge uh, uh, company, instrument company, which was founded by, by uh, Eindhoven, which produced these, these devices. It's there you see some electric uh, um, or maybe mechanical motor, which is running the film in the, in the box. Another picture of the same. So it was Clement. Ader, or Ader, Ader, I think, uh, who invented in 1897 the string galvanometer. And you see its construction here in more detail. There is an uh, arc lamp, a very bright light source, lens system. Here is a constant uh, uh, static magnet. And between the poles of the magnet, there is uh, uh, a quartz string, so very thin uh, conducting wire made from uh, quartz and uh, there is a hole through these south and north poles of the magnet and when uh, there is current flowing through this string uh, due, due to the electric forces it is moving in the strong static magnetic field 
And there are some lenses again here, and the uh, illustration, uh, the shade of the string is uh, uh, projected here. I visited London Hammersmith Hospital in 1973, and there was still in the cardiology department uh, in the side room this instrument. Maybe it was not anymore used, it was in storage room, but anyhow, it was in the cardiology department still available. I think the Englishmen are a bit more conservative than German colleagues. Uh, Augustus Woller already defined, invented or defined so-called cardinal leads. So he defined 10 leads for uh, recording the electric activity of the heart. Let's show it just on this uh, uh, human illustration. He used as recording points both arms and both legs and then a fifth recording point which was a silver spoon in the mouth. That sounds a bit funny but always when I am lecturing this slide I always uh, say that why don't we try the silver spoon in the mouth just as an experiment in some some experimental work because that's that sounds very smart. In my point of view uh, uh, I, I think it's very smart because firstly there is no doubt where the mouth is it is easy to loc locate. Secondly uh, it is mouth is wet so the contact to the body to the internal uh, fluids of the body is excellent and having a silver spoon in the mouth and connecting uh, the, the recording instrument wires in certain leads to that spoon that's technically and physiologically very smart but it's not used anymore at all so I just said again as many times before I suggest that why don't we do just an experiment and see how it works because it's, it, it is smart. Sounds funny, but it is smart. So the cardinal leads of Waller, lead one, lead two, lead three, lead four, lead five, six, seven, eight, nine, and ten. So all these are the all possibilities, all alternatives uh, uh, between these five recording points and these were just uh, documented by Augustus Waller. So, shown here again, actually Wilhelm Eindhoven did not invent the Eindhoven leads. They were invented by Augustus Waller Wilhelm Eindhoven just left those seven other leads off. So he took these three leads. This has to be kept in mind. And, and the credit should be given to Augustus Waller. And I return to this concept of Eindhoven triangle. Eindhoven assumed that the lead vectors for these three leads are the edges of an equilateral triangle. If the body, the volume conductor, is a homogeneous sphere and the heart is in the center of the sphere and the recording points are located here at the corners of an equilateral triangle and we join these points with these lines they form the lead vectors for lead one two and three and they are the edges of the equilateral triangle and as i told you before this is true only in the homogeneous sphere or infinite homogeneous volume conductor if that the uh, body is uh, has an an other form which is certainly has, then that is not anymore true, but uh, in this uh, simplified, idealized situation it is true. So why Eindhoven wanted to 
define that the three leads form really an equilateral triangle. I think I may have told it before, I have a one publication where is, uh, is uh, uh, repeated Eithomas' letter to some of his colleagues, and he just said that uh, it should be equilateral triangle because that is just the most beautiful uh, triangle. So there's no physiological, no electronic, no bioelectromagnetic uh, 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 facts behind it. It is just the beauty of the equilateral triangle. So he made it very simplified, very much simplified assumption. I have some pictures of the early recordings uh, of ECG. Very serious fellow here is, uh, who is uh, from who is taken ECG. It is shown here the lead one. And other illustration as well. Then about the ECG signal. How the ECG signal is uh, generated. Assume we have here a, a piece of cardiac muscle and uh, it is on the left side, it is uh, grounded and on the right side we have a, a recording instrument and it is uh, taking place a depolarization here. Depolarization wavefront is moving here to the left time is going to the right. During the depolarization, positive sodium ions flow from outside to inside of the cell. In resting state, the inside of the uh, cardiac muscle cells here have negative potential inside compared to the positive outside in the interstitial space, but when this positive ions move into the cell, then inside of the cell uh, turns positive and relatively to that the outside the interstitial space is negative. So here is formed these positives and negatives uh, potentials in the interstitial space, not inside the cells but in the, in the uh, medium between, forms a double layer which is on the left side is positive and right side it is negative. So this is the double layer and the depolarization is moving to the left and because the positive side is uh, uh, leading, what is recorded here is a positive signal. In repolarization, the positive potassium ions flow out from inside the cell, making the inside of the cell more negative and then relatively to the interstitial space the inside is uh, negative and outside is positive. So now we have a double layer in the opposite polarity and repolarization is moving to the left and because it is the negative side is leading it is recorded here a negative potential. That's it. So the, the uh, paradox here is that uh, initially I have told you and you know that the inside of the cells in resting state is negative. After depolarization it changes to positive and in repolarization it turns to negative. But it is not the inside of the cells, the potential inside of the cells, which actually is recorded in, in the full uh, muscle, it is the potential changes outside the cell. So this is sounds uh, uh, confusing, a bit strange. This is an explanation of Robert Plonzi to this, this phenomenon. Uh, I, I want to believe what Robert Plonzi says and this is logical, but somehow the magnitudes of the, uh, of the cells in the interstitial and inside the cell, uh, I wonder does it just work like that, but apparently it works because the polarities anyhow with this way of thinking are correct. So let us believe to this explanation. 
Now I just uh, show four possibilities uh, in, in these recordings. Assume that there is a depolarization taking place in the cell, uh, in, the, in the muscle, uh, um, piece of muscle, and depolarization wavefront is moving from right to the left. So, as I told you in the previous slide, there is a positive side of the double layer uh, heading to this uh, recording electrode, and it is recorded positive signal. Assume that we record the same phenomenon with the detector, which is the active electrode, is on the other end of the piece of, of, of uh, muscle. Now the positive side is uh, going away from the recording electrode, so we record a negative signal. In repolarization it is opposite. The negative side of the double layer is moving towards the recording electrode, we record a negative signal, and if we make a recording so that active electrode is on the other side, repolarization is proceeding to the left, then minus times minus is plus, we record a positive signal. So please observe the cases A and D. In both cases it is recorded a positive signal. And if the activation is not proceeding directly towards the recording electrode, but to some other direction, we just observe what is the component of, of the, the activation in this direction. We record uh, correspondingly a bit smaller signal here. Let's have a look to the activation of the heart. Before the activation process starts, the whole cardiac muscle throughout is uh, depolarized. But there is silence, nothing is happening. Then depolarization takes place in the sinus node and activation is proceeding along the atrial wall and there can be seen small elementar uh, activation uh, sources throughout this uh, this double layer or, or this uh, uh, frontier uh, uh, proceeding depolarization frontier and we take a resultant of all these elementary vectors and the resultant electric activity is this yellow vector. It's proceeding to that direction. If we place this activity equivalent electric heart vector inside or somewhere to the Eindhoven triangle and take its projections on the leads 1, 2 and 3, you see that we get positive signals, which is uh, the atrial activity, the P wave, positive in lead 1, large positive in lead 2 and small positive in lead 3. After 200 milliseconds, the atria have fully depolarized and there is a silence because as I told you there is a boundary between atria and ventricles and the activation is not able to proceed directly from the atria to the ventricles. It is proceeding to the AV node and to the bundle of his. In the AV node it is proceeding so slowly that, and it is so small in the uh, area that this activation cannot be seen on the service recording. So there is electrical silence at that instant of time. Then activation proceeds along the bundle of his and the left and right uh, uh, bundle branches. And activation is starting here on the septum. It is uh, on the left side and proceeding to the right. So this initial activation placed here generates negative signal in lead 1, small negative in lead 2, and it is in direction of lead 3 lead vector, it gives a positive signal here. Here I want to point out, which I did show you earlier, 
that if we have this illustration in the frontal plane and the electrodes are in the frontal plane like they are in Eithoven experiments, Eithoven triangle, we do not observe the branch, anterior branch of the left bundle branch which is uh, proceeding anteriorly and we don't observe the most early ventricular activation which is on the anterior part of the left ventricle. 230 milliseconds from the beginning. Now the ventricular muscle starts to activate due to the left and right bundle branches here in the apex. In the septum region the activations are opposite, they cancel each other, so the total uh, resultant activity is from the apex of uh, part of both left and right ventricles and that is the total uh, sum of the activation. And you see corresponding uh, activation uh, or, or signals in leads 1, 2 and 3. And here 240 milliseconds from the beginning activation has proceeded in the right ventricle throughout and proceeding quite far in the left ventricle. It has gone through the right ventricular wall because it is so much thinner than the left ventricular wall. And because it has gone through, it is so-called breakthrough, there is no more depolarization activity here on the left, right ventricular side. It is only here on the left ventricular side. There is nothing here on the right ventricular side to compensate or cancel the left ventricular activity. And therefore, the cardiac, the resultant cardiac vector is strongest at this instant of time pointing uh, left and down in this direction. And the signal in the lead 1 is strongest and lead 2 it is strongest. But in lead 3, because uh, the orientation of the lead vector, it is not so strong, but it is a bit negative. And finally, late left ventricular depolarization. Uh, again, you, the vector is shown here you see how the projections are on each lead. At 350 milliseconds, the ventricles are fully depolarized and there is electrical silence. You see there is not, no activity recorded in leads 1, 2 and 3. Then 450 milliseconds instant, there starts the repolarization of ventricles. But the repolarization proceeds in opposite direction than the depolarization. It proceeds from the outer surface towards the inner surface of the ventricular muscle. And because minus times minus is plus, this activation, resultant activation is in the same direction as the depolarization wavefront. And we get positive and positive signals and here negative. But because the repolarization is slower process then the T wave which is representing the repolarization is much wider than the depolarization activity, the QRS complex. So that's the story. That's how the electric activation of the cardiac muscle is reflected to the Eindhoven leads 1, 2 and 3 and form the electrocardiogram. This is the normal <coughs> electrocardiogram. What is normal? Well, uh, that is a kind of average from all the millions of healthy people or something like that. It is considered kind of standard electrocardiogram and there are the uh, uh, the deflections, the waves are in alphabetical order, P, Q, R, S, T, U, and there are defined some uh, uh, regions or segments or intervals, P, R segment, P, R interval, Q, 
QRS interval, QT interval, ST interval, and so on. You can find how they are here. And the standard ECG recording paper, and of course today in the computer screen and the monitors, is shown here, which gives the, the easy visual scale for the signal. So in the normal ECG, the P is uh, consequence of the atrial depolarization. QRS is uh, uh, consequence of ventricular depolarization. T is ventricular repolarization. And how is atrial repolarization? Well, it takes place during the ventricular depolarization and therefore it cannot be seen in, in the recorded signal. But what is the U, the U wave? That's a simple story. This is the most accurate definition which I obtained for, for the U wave. U wave is not always seen. It is typically small and by definition follows the T wave. U waves are thought to represent the repolarization of the papillary muscles or Purkinje fibers. Prominent U waves are most often seen in hypokalemia but may be present in hyperkalemia, tyrotoxicis or exposure to digitalis, epinephrine and class 1a and 3 antiarrhythmics, as well as in con congenital long QT syndrome and in the setting of intracranial hemorrhage. An inverted U wave may represent myocardial ischemia or left ventricular volume overload. That's it. So it is a kind of mystery what it is. It has been studied quite a lot, but no simple single explanation has not been published for that. There was a famous Finnish cardiologist, Pentti Rautahari, who worked for a long time in, in Halifax, Canada, and then he moved to Edmonton in, Cali uh, in Canada. Now he's in Florida and retired. He made, uh, he, he was prominent, uh, competent, uh, active scientist. He made a lot of work with trying to find what is the U wave, but he didn't get a sing, sing, single and simple explanation for that. It is not always seen, and when it is seen, it is seen in the abdominal uh, uh, surface of the body. Uh, but why it exists, this is just. It is, that's a scientific explanation, but it is, I feel it's more a joke than, than an explanation. So you find that it can, there can be any possible reason which may come to your mind to explain what is the U-wave. So that's a mystery. But I don't see that there is too much uh, diagnostic value with the U-wave, so we can just forget it. I go to the Wilson Central Terminal. Starting with the Eindhoven Triangle and taking the vectors, lead vectors from the center of the uh, uh, spherical volume conductor from the location of the source to the recording points, uh, CR, CL and CF. Taking a dot product with these and, and the uh, cardiac source, we get the potentials on the recording points. Eindhoven limb leads are just differences of the corresponding potentials as we already very well know. Wilson wanted to study electric potentials on the surface of the chest and he used as a reference electrode so-called central terminal. He defined it in this way. He connected five kilo ohms resistors to those recording points and joined them together and that point is the central terminal. Please note that it's a bit difficult to draw it symmetrically beautifully uh, Otherwise, but it is just here on the surface, looks like it is on the surface of the chest, but no, it is not touching the skin. No, it is just uh, uh, the, the resistors are connected together, but this point is in the air. It is not touching the skin. 
So the, that, that may be misleading in the illustrations. So please, it is, it is not touching the skin. This is the central terminal, is a reference, and the recording electrode may be used for recording uh, potentials on the thorax or wherever. It can be used also for recording potentials on these standard recording points. And if you just make the calculation, you find that what is the potential of the central terminal, it is average of the limb potentials. So this is kind of classical misunderstanding in electrocardiology. Uh, the cardiologists easily think that it is a neutral point, neutral ground reference. No, it is not. It is just simply average of these three recording point potentials. That's what it is. But it's, it's still, it works well, but it is for our engineer, for us engineers, it is important to understand that it is not a neutral ground reference. It is an average of these three recording points. That's the point. Now we get three more leads. If we use as a reference this central terminal and record the potentials from right and left arm and left leg, we get three more leads. And the lead vectors are just these lead vectors here in the homogeneous sphere uh, model. And the potentials are here, or, or the leads. There's a beautiful painting of Mr. Frank Norman Wilson, uh, inventor of the Wilson Central Terminal. Mr. Goldberger, I, unfortunately I have not found a photograph of Mr. Goldberger, even though he got himself to the uh, pages of the history of electrocardiology. He found that, uh -huh, when recording the Wilson lead VL, we can just omit the 5 kilo ohm resistance from the central terminal going to the left arm. Similarly in these two other leads. Because then in the image space, the refer that is the signal where we record, the reference is moving from the center of the image surface to this middle of the line joining F and R. Which means that actually this lead vector, corresponding lead vector, comes 50% longer. So let's have a look here. Here is, uh, here are shown uh, the Goldberger augmented leads uh, and that is the Goldberger augmented lead lead vector, and that is the Wilson lead lead vector. And you find, when you go through these equations, that in the Wilson lead, the Vf is 2 phi sub f minus phi sub r minus phi l over 3. And the Avf is 2 phi sub f minus phi sub l minus phi sub r over 2. Two. So it is 50% uh, more sensitive. That is the point. Signal is exactly the same form because the lead vector is in the same direction, but the lead vector is 50% longer. The signal is 50% uh, uh, higher in amplitude. So this is a smart but not so very complicated but smart invention of Mr. Goldberger. And these are the Goldberger augmented leads, which, is, which are the development of the Wilson leads. Then precordial leads. This is the original reason for Wilson to uh, use the central terminal. Now the central terminal is drawn in this way, so you ease more easily find here that it is really not touching the skin. It is just connection of these three 5 kilo ohm resistances and having it as a reference point, recording points from the surface of the chest was the original idea of Wilson to get three-dimensional uh, recording. These uh, 
precordial leads or recording points, of course, are standardized, and the standardization, because they are just uh, uh, used in the standard uh, 12 lead ECG. In the fourth intercostal space between the, the ribs, on the both sides of the sternum are V1 and V2. V4 is in the fifth intercostal space at the mid-clavicular line, and V6 is on the same horizontal level on the mid-axillary line. And correspondingly, V3 and V5 are in the middle of corresponding electrodes. V7 may be also used, and also may be used recording points which are symmetrically uh, on the right side of the chest. When these right side of the chest are uh, recording points are used, there is one important application where they are used. Do you know? It is called a, called a, 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 a case, dextrocardia. It means that I don't, don't have a number, I should find a number, but some people have the internal organs as a mirror image from, from what, what uh, most of us have. So we are, we are not right ones, but we are the majority with which have the heart on the left side. And those who have the right heart on the right side, they just, for them, I use the right side electrodes. That's the story. I should find, it's easy, I think it's easy to find from, from Google nowadays how many, for this a percentage of dextrocardia people. They don't have any, any problems, no problems, but they just are mirror images. Why we are, well, the, one could think that 50% of people would have <laughs> dextrocardia and 50% on the left hand side, but that's not the case. For some reason, great majority of the people have heart on the left side. That they are the great mysteries of life. Okay, here is finally now the 12 lead system. I repeat, Eindhoven limb leads, one, V1, V2, V3. Goldberger augmented leads, which are amplified or more sensitive Wilson leads, AVR, AVL, AVF, and precordial leads, V1 to V6. Augmented means amplified. Therefore, there is a small a. The projections of the lead vectors in case that we assume that the body is a homogeneous sphere look like this. These lead vectors are not of the same length. AVF and V2, the precordial lead vectors are, are much shorter than the limb leads 1, 2 and 3, which are the longest ones. And uh, these are these uh, uh, precordial leads. And as I have shown you, actually in real case, the, the precordial leads have much longer lead vectors than the standard limb leads because the recording points are closer to the heart. But if thinking this, uh, this homogeneous uh, sphere model, then they look like this. In recording the 12 lead ECG, there is a standard. It is in the instrument, it is a button. By pressing it, it records instead of AVR, it records minus AVR. And why is that? The reason is that it is more beautiful uh, in, in the recording when the, the frontal plane vectors are forming a nice sequence of, uh, of six vectors like this, similarly as the transverse plane like this. It is logical, it is, it is okay. Uh, there are several modifications of the 12 lead system. So firstly, I would say that the, the 12 lead system is a consequence of long historical development. And it is the standard. It is the standard recording uh, system, lead system, which is used in hospital. When the patient is taken to the hospital, what is first taken is a 12 lead ECG. That's it. But of course, there are certain modifications of that. Uh, in exercise ECG is used often uh, or mostly one certain modification. What is exercise ECG? Exercise ECG means that uh, it is possible 
to find out some problems in the heart, diseases, which appear when there is some stress, when, when, when the body is exercising, doing, uh, doing uh, mechanical work, heart is beating uh, more uh, actively, at a higher rate, and then certain cardiac diseases can be di diagnosed during the exercise. So exercise is just uh, uh, make, making some work, and there are two kind of standard exercises uh, in, in the world. One is bicycle ergometer, is kind of, of, of uh, bicycle, uh, which is uh, uh, which, which is bike, there is some resistance in, in, the, in the pedals and, and that gives the exercise. And the other one is treadmill. There is uh, the belt which is, uh, which is moving and the patient is walking on the belt and, and the level of the belt is raised uh, slowly so that uh, it is harder to walk there. Similarly in the bicycle ergometer the resistance is increased during the test so that it becomes strong, harder and harder and harder to, to bike. What is the difference between these? Uh, they give quite similar uh, diagnostic uh, results and ex uh, quite similar results. The main difference is that, uh, that uh, uh, if there is a high body weight, if, there is a, uh, if it's a very heavy weight patient, then uh, the certain standard uh, uh, walking is uh, uh, more stressing to such patient than biking because the patient needs to carry the body weight during the exercise. So that is uh, the main uh, difference. And then there is a geographical difference. The bicycle ergometer is used in the uh, most parts of the, of the world, but the treadmill is used especially in the United States. Why? I don't know historical reasons. Uh, the problem in, in this exercise ECG recording which raises is that because of the muscular uh, movement and, and, and the electromyogram coming from, from the muscles of the, of the arms and, and legs, there's coming a lot of noise to the ECG signal. And Mason and Ligar uh, developed this Mason-Ligar modification which is the standard modification which is used in exercise tests. The idea in the major ligar modification is that, uh, that it is uh, avoided the arm and leg uh, movement uh, uh, noise by placing the arm electrodes here, right arm electrode, left arm electrode and left leg electrode here. That is a difference. The chest uh, precordial electrode points are the same as in, in uh, 12 lead ECG normally. So in the mason Likar modification, the idea is that, uh, that here is uh, a place under the clavicle where there is not muscles. You can just, uh, I usually ask uh, students to try if you just uh, take this position under this clavicle bone, you find a kind of, kind of a deep, deep region here. Just please try it. Uh, under, under the middle of the cl clavicle bone, bone. It's, it's a deep, uh, l deep pit, and it's therefore that there is no muscle, or practically no muscle. Because there's no muscle, there's coming no noise, muscular activity. So that's a smart, smart uh, invention. Secondly, the muscular activity of the legs is avoided by recording the left leg here uh, on, on, the, on the, the, uh, this uh, hip bone, because it is in this location, it is just under the skin and there is no muscle on or between the bone and the skin. When if you just try under your belt here, you find that the, 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 the hip bone here is just under the skin. There's no, no muscle. So that's a, that's a good, good point. So the right arm electrode point is in the 
intracavular fossa medial to the border of the deltoid muscle, two centimeters below the lower border of the clavicle, same on the left arm electrode. Left leg electrode is on the left iliac crest on the hip bone, and right electrode is at the right iliac fossa. I show the anatomy here. This is from the anatomy, anatomy uh, book illustration. Here is a fossa, and you find, this is a real anatomic illustration of the human, human anatomy. There is practically no muscle in this region. And because there's no muscle, there's minimal uh, uh, electromyographic noise coming from this region. That's it. If you have a look to this beautiful, famous picture of Netter, you find it is beautifully illustrated, even though it is not the real purpose to show the fossa. He is a good anatomist and painter. You can find from the illustration there is a fossa. Next time when you go to the art gallery, see the sculptures uh, of, of, uh, of, of objects without clothes or paintings, please observe this fossa. If the painter is good in anatomy, he has drawn this fossa here. <laughs> That's the point. Then there are other systems also. In Lund, there is a very active and competent group in cardiology. In Lund, in <laughs> University Hospital in Sweden. Uh, Ulle Palm is, is the uh, chief cardiologist there. They're, they published in 2011, which is not not long time ago. This is quite quite new paper. A Lund system. Uh, they have, this compared to the major ligar and Lund system, uh, major ligar points are here. In Lund system, the electrodes are here on the arms, and uh, here lower in, in the left leg, not on the hip bone, but just in the middle here. And with the open circles are shown the limb lead recording points of, of standard 12 lead EZG. They claim that the Lund system is more noise immune than the standard 12 lead ECG. Yes, I believe that. And they claim that it is, the noise immunity is of the same order as Mason Likar. That sounds uh, a bit, uh, uh, I'm not quite sure about this. Uh, I have to get more information on this. It is not long time ago since, since I, I, I found this paper. What they say in the, the authors in, in the Lund system article, they say that it is not intended for exercise test. So it is for monitoring purposes. When the patient is lying on the bed and is it is recording for longer time monitoring, then the movement of the patient uh, don't make so much noise to the ECG signal. It is quite the same noise immunity as with the Mason Likar. But so it is not intended for uh, exercise test, but I should have more information. Maybe I should write a uh, letter to Ulle Palm, whom I, whom I know, and ask that uh, uh, how does it behave uh, in real exercise test compared to Mason Likar. I do not know, but if you sometimes are involved in exercise test ECGs, I think you should know the Lund system, Mason Ligar system. Mason Ligar is a standard, but you should say to the cardiologist that why don't we try to do the Lund system? And, and then you can just find which one is better. There are some ASI modification. I, I just for curiosity, I, I show this. There are, of course, several modifications of the standard systems. The information content of the 12 lead system. I come again to this uh, uh, illustration and I ask <coughs> what leads are needed for recording the cardiac electric dipole? What would you suggest? Firstly, how many leads? What's the minimum? To record the cardiac electric dipole. How many leads are needed? You are not brave enough. <laughs> is one sufficient? No. Is two sufficient? No. Is three sufficient? <laughs> yes, it is. Three is sufficient. The dipole has three components, X, Y, and Z. So three 
leads, recording three leads, that's it. What three leads you would recommend if we have this uh, uh, trivial model? What three leads would be sufficient? You are so shy. <laughs> Give some suggestions. Okay, I, I show you. This is a good suggestion. For the X lead, it is V2, that is pointing forward. For Y lead, it is lead 1, it is pointing to the left. And for Z lead, it is the minus AVF, because AVF is to the negative Z direction. So recording these three leads only gives the cardiac electric dipole. If the heart is fully dipolar and we want to record the dipole, that's it. The other leads are not needed. Why they are recorded if they are not needed? needed? So, the reason is that for historical reasons, for a great deal. I tell you the truth, which is that uh, the first six leads, one, two, three, AVR, AVL and AVF, are recorded from the same electrode positions. So I claim that uh, please give me any two of those uh, recordings. I can easily calculate to you the four other with full accuracy. So there is redundancy. You don't gain anything more from recording leads 2, 3, AVR, R and AVL if you record 1 and AVF. So those are redundant. There's nothing, no new information. Absolutely no new information. How it is with the chest leads? Well, the heart, uh, heart is not 100% uh, dipole. And the recordings are made quite close to the heart. So recording all the chest leads gives a little bit more information. A little bit, but not too much. But from the frontal plane leads, even though the heart were more quadrupolar or whichever or whichever it made, but if it is a dipolar, it's a dipolar, it is sufficient that you record these two leads or any two. Th these are logical ones, but any two then the four other ones are fully redundant. So this is historical reason. This, this is something, again, that, uh, as I said, that if uh, everything what has been done before would be forgotten and uh, we should start the life from zero, then it, would, it could be designed in a different way. If and when this is the case, why are those, all those 12 leads still recorded? Well, the historical reason is uh, very much the case that uh, when having all these projections in frontal plane recorded, all those six signals, in manual uh, diagnosis, which is not done anymore, I think that new cardiologist generation do cannot do the manual diagnosis anymore. But anyhow, some years ago, it was helpful for the cardiologist to see the different projections of, 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 the, of the recordings to find out more easily what is the orientation of the cardiac dipole or so. So it is just a practical issue. But in the transverse plane 
there is a little bit more information marginally coming from the other other five leads. That is the point. So this is this is a historical historical development and you should as engineers you should be aware what is the fact. Here I have the, the beautiful illustration of the young girl from whom is recorded the 12 lead easy chair. I just draw her a t-shirt so that it is because she's so shy. This is a nice uh, mural in the in, uh, Cardiological Institute in Mexico City. Diego Mural has, uh, Diego, uh, sorry, Diego Rivera has painted this mural. They are uh, presented uh, important historical uh, person, scientist in cardiology, starting, st starting from Galvani. And uh, this uh, Eindhoven is, this Waller is there anyhow, Wilson is there. I, th I think that he's, he's Eindhoven, and Wenkebach is on the left. That was about the 12 lead ECG. Next I go to vector cardiography. Vector cardiographic lead systems. <laughs> I show you this polar picture <laughs> again, <laughs> because that is that is the picture. The heart is a dipolar source. <laughs> if and when it is a dipolar source, then why to record all the twelve leads? Why not to record only the three orthogonal leads? That's a question. That's a good question. And that question has been made and solutions have been done for this question. The cardiac, equivalent cardiac source, the cardiac vector, its trajectory is shown here in this famous uh, Netter illustration. I did show this, uh, the, this is shows the, the, the uh, uh, path where the tip of the uh, vector is traveling during the cardiac cycle. I did show during the cardiac activation exp illustration explanation how this looks in the frontal plane, which is shown here, but it is moving in this way in the space, and when uh, uh, projecting this to all three standard planes, we get the three vector cardiographic loops. There is something uh, kind of curiosity. I do not see any physiological requirement of demands for that. It, uh, in my understanding, it just happens, happens to be the fact that the three loops, the atrial activity, ventricular activity, and ventricular repolarization, P, QRS, and T loops, they are all practically in the same plane. You see it from this illustration. Why they are in the same plane? Why they are not in three different planes? I don't see there any, any requirement. It just happens to be, it is physiologically so that they are in the same plane. So it's a, just a curiosity. But then, in my understanding, here is a mistake. Uh, the rotation dire direction of the loop is wrong. It is, uh, as I did show in the, in the electric activity illustrations, it is opposite direction. So here is, uh, in my understanding, here is a mistake in, in Frank Netter's illustration. But on the other hand, I've got some information from some cardiologists. I, sh I haven't checked it from, from ori uh, uh, original sources. But I've got some information that in some persons that is true that the loops are in opposite direction orientation than in the majority. Why? I do not know. That's just mysteries of life. Here you see just one picture of, of the series of pictures which I did show, and you see how they these loops are 
rotating in counterclockwise direction and here they are rotating in clockwise direction. So to make the vector cardiography we need to record the cardiac equivalent cardiac vector in three orthogonal planes and what I did show you with the set of these illustrations I did show how they were recorded in frontal plane. Here it is shown how they go in three orthogonal planes. The electric activity of the heart is going like that and it is shown in three orthogonal planes and if the signals are amplified and uh, uh, and, and placed to the deflection plates of the oscilloscope they just form this kind of illustration and I have recognized that the younger generations don't anymore know what is an oscilloscope here is an oscilloscope here is a cathode ray tube and there are deflection plates which deflect the cathode ray to the on the screen just in this way. So nowadays these oscilloscopes are not anymore used. They are shown just on the computer screen. The vector cardiographic lead systems may be divided to two main categories. Uncorrected and corrected lead systems. Uncorrected lead systems mean that the person who has developed the system has not paid any attention, no attention to the inhomogeneities and boundaries in the volume conductor of the body, simplified the problem just so simple that it is omitted all the effects of the body and in the corrected systems of course they are taken more or less into account. In uncorrected vector graphic lead systems, the source is a point dipole and the conductor is infinite homogeneous or finite spherical homogeneous. Uh, infinite homogeneous is, is uh, uh, more relevant. The first vector cardiogram was uh, uh, developed or invented by Hubert Mann in 1920. He took the three Eindhoven lead recordings, lead one, two and three, and each instant of time from these three signals, he oriented them to the center and two of these leads signals, uh, the, the recording should meet in the same point and the third of course comes to the same point as well and makes the projection more accurate. So if three, these are the lead one, two and three recordings that is the projection of the cardiac vector in the space. But here is a mistake which is that uh, the understanding of the polarity of the signal at that time was opposite than today so this should be changed to opposite polarity and now when the electric activity proceeds in each of the leads they just form this projection which is the loop. The projection of the vector cardiographic loop, the trajectory of the tip of the cardiac heart vector in the space during the uh, electric activation of the heart. That is the vector cardiogram which is manually point by point drawn on the paper. But Hubert Mann also developed an instrument which makes it. He had these three coils here to which the Eindhoven signals are fed, strong static magnet. So due to this uh, activities, uh, electric activity, the system inside the magnet is moving and here is a mirror and when having a light source here, the mirror moves the ray of light to a photographic film, uh, filming the vector cardiogram. Here and in the previous slide, it is seen how strong effect the three Eindhoven leads had to electrocardiography during those times. The, he did not have X and Y coordinates, but he had these three leads, uh, Eindhoven leads in this system. Holman and Holman developed an oscilloscope tube which did not have 
the, the deflection plates in the horizontal and vertical direction, but just three pairs like the Eindhoven leads and signals were fed to these vacuum tube amplifiers here, here and here and the amplifiers amplify the signals to these deflection plates and it formed to the oscilloscope screen the signal. So the vacuum tubes were used before transistors. I just show here an, an, an antique vacuum tube triode. And this is the same thing drawn in a bit different way. So that is a vector cardiographic uh, system. Then it was uh, thought that the Eindhoven triangle is not the real uh, uh, whole story. Why not to use the three orthogonal body axes? That's a good, that is a good point. But still, origin of the signal for uh, three body axis uh, displays was the Eindhoven leads in the Wilson tetrahedron. So what means tetrahedron? The polyhedrons which have uh, four planes is a tetrahedron and for instance pyramid has five planes. So the idea, the word tetrahedron which Wilson used is that uh, he imagined that the recording points joint in the space form a tetrahedron. So he started from the Eindhoven leads and the Y lead is just lead one, pointing towards the direction of Y coordinate. Z lead is from, from foot to his central terminal in the direction of Z. And X lead, which is pointing forward, needs an electrode which is just the tip of the tetrahedron. Very difficult to find. It is on the back level of the spinous process of the seventh thoracic vertebra, 2.5 centimeters to the left. That's where it is located. Wilson tetrahedron was used quite a bit before better systems were developed. I show you some more uncorrected systems. At those times, every cardiologist who wanted to get some uh, reputation in, in, the, in the discipline developed his own uncorrected vector cardiographic lead system. Here is a system of Shellong. I do not go to the details. Here is Kimura, apparently a Japanese uh, cardiologist who took the third dimension uh, to the system. Here is Tuchosal and Sulzer system. Here is Grishman system. This Grishman was called Grishman cube because the lead vectors which he imagined to be like this, of course they are not like that, but they just in the space look like that. They form a cube and Tuchosal Sulzer system was called a double cube because the lead vector between Q and N was two times longer. And then there's a Milnor was uh, wanted to get his name to the history by just taking uh, two other corners of the uh, cube for his leads. So there uh, are over 30 vector uncorrected vector cardiography lead systems published in the literature, over 30. And I claim that all of those are equally bad. As a curiosity, I tell you about Akulinichev system. I somehow I somehow this is complicated, but somehow I like it. Here are Mr. Kovarchuk and uh, 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 Ivan Timoyev Akulinichev in Moscow in 1968. So uh, in Akulinichev had a five-plane lead system where the recording electrodes are on the chest here and one electrode on the back in this location. Amplifying the signals and uh, feeding them to the uh, uh, deflection plates of the oscilloscope gives a Kulinichev system. And it is very difficult to think if you just bend these, uh, these sides together to a pyramid, so on those projection planes, the, is it the vector cardiographic signal exists. So this Akulinichev system was used only in Soviet Union. And I still don't remember, I should find it again, in some of the 
East European countries. I think it was in Romania. I'm, I'm not sure, but in, in Romania. But nowhere else in the world. But Akulinice was used in Soviet Union solely. Very complicated planes and, and difficult to think how it behaves. Uh, then I had some problems with the Akulinice system because there was very small amount of information in the, in the journals which I, I did read from cardiology. That was still in the, during the time of, of Soviet Union. I visited my uh, uh, cardiologist friend in, in Charité Hospital in East Berlin, uh, Dr. Schubert, and, and he kindly gave me a, a, a book, booklet of, of Akulinichev uh, lead system. That was in Russian. I read fluently Russian, but don't understand anything what I read. But I found the illustrations, and I finally found that uh, how it solved the problem. Akulinichev had designed two systems, this five-plane system and, which is shown here again, and a three-plane system. The five-plane system is complicated and I do not see the benefits of the five-plane system. But the three-plane system, this has some idea. How well it works is an, another issue, but it has some idea which I tell you. He used the three orthogonal coordinate planes, but not the same what we are used to have. He rotated this coordinate system 45 degrees. And the idea behind that is that the heart is rotated 45 degrees. So this is the coordinate, orthogonal coordinate system of the heart, not that of the body. And that's some idea. It has shown the electrode positions here. I do not go to the details, but anyhow, there is some idea in this system. Now I go to the corrected vector cardiographic lead systems, and I think I am able to present and show the Frank lead system. So the Frank lead system is the vector cardiographic lead system which is still used in cardiology. Ernest Frank published it in 1956, and his preconditions for the system were point dipole for the source and finite homogeneous volume conductor. He applied the method image surface in designing this system. So how a homogeneous model looks like, this is a homogeneous model in our vector magnet magnetocardiography studies in, in Tampere. So it is a, a plastic torso model and the inside inhomogeneities are separately here. They are placed inside for the experiments, just as an example about homogeneous model of the thorax. I have shown you before this uh, uh, Frank model. I just repeat that uh, it is a plastic model, which is in his experiments, it is upside down because it is easier to, to manipulate the dipole in the heart from this larger opening. It's filled by uh, sodium chloride solution, so it is homogeneous, there is no inhomogeneity uh, uh, modeled. It is, uh, coordinate system is made so that it is, uh, there are defined 12 planes, uh, two inches distance, he was American, two inches, which is five centimeters. Level six is on the level of the heart, and it has a male uh, thorax, and uh, uh, its uh, cross section is shown here. Uh, the heart is in the, in the transverse plane is locating four centimeters front and one inch, 2.5 centimeters left from these anatomical coordinate planes. And having these kind of lines going through the uh, central axis, 22.5 degrees angle, when they cross the surface of the thorax, the uh, points are uh, named with alphabetics from A to P. And this is how the image surface, he measured the image surface and this is how the image surface looks like in frontal plane. 
How did he measure the image surface? What did he do for getting the image surface? I think I have asked this before. He placed to the location of the heart three orthogonal dipoles, fed a unit current to each of them consecutively, not at the same time, and measured the pot corresponding potentials on all these recording points and placed these uh, potential values to the coordinate axes and that's it. So he got the points uh, in image space for each point. So these are the lead vectors on the level 6 and these are lead vectors on level 5. Frank was cardiologist by education. He was a smart and technically oriented cardiologist, but he was, he was not engineer, he was a cardiologist. And that was a great benefit in Frank lead system. The criteria which he had in designing the lead system was that it should be easy to apply. Of course, that saves a lot of time in, in clinical work. It should have a good reproducibility. That is important. The good reproducibility is important because when ECG or vector cardiogram is recorded today in Uniclinic and when it was recorded 10 years ago in Berlin Charité from the same person, there should be a reliable comparison between these two recordings so that they are certainly recorded in the same way and the reproducibility is good. So that is a very important clinical aspect. And he uh, wanted to avoid the left hand problem which is a not so well recognized problem in electrocardiology but is very important. What is the left hand problem? The left hand problem is that if you think recording lead one, the lead field looks something like this in the region of the heart. But if the patient who is lying on the, on the table for recording happens to keep the left hand just connecting to the left side of the body, skin is a bit wet, then the lead field actually flows like that. And you may see that that is not anymore the lead one, that is more lead two. So that is an important issue that when uh, ECG is recorded from the patient, the patient should not have hands on the sides, he should have hands not touching on the sides. But he designed a system which is more or less immune to this left hand problem. Here is shown the left hand problem, I think this patient has the left arm too close to the, to the chest. Let's find out how Frank constructed the uh, leads. Let's start with the Y component. How the Y component is detected? To detect the Y component of the source, the lead vector, of course, shall be in the direction of the Y axis. Because if the lead vector is in the direction of y axis, you take the dot product of the lead vector and the source vector, you recognize that it is the y component of the source vector which is detected. That is the key issue. And hopefully the lead vector has to be as long as possible to get as strong signal as possible. So here is shown the Frank uh, uh, image surface what Frank uh, measured in transverse plane. What electrodes you would like to use for recording the Y component? And the Y axis is pointing 
to this direction, so to the left in the patient. Which electrodes you would prefer? Do you have any suggestions? You are so shy. Okay. Sorry? Number one. Number one? From where? Y direction, yes. But where is the, the electrode? On, on what level? So I, I'm speaking about this uh, uh, image surface here. So which level you would select? And what electrode? So number one here is the level one. So which, which level you would select? These are the level numbers. So I will help you. To have the longest possible lead vector, which gives the strongest possible signal, it seems to be beneficial to be on the level 6, which is the level of the heart. So if being on the level 6, between which electrodes, they are the alphabetical uh, numbered, between which electrodes you would take the measurement to get the strongest signal, the longest lead vector in the direction of y-axis? B, and what is the other electrode? The reference B, because you must have two electrodes. B, level three. That one? D. D. This one? Uh huh, okay. Well, uh, if it is on level three, here is three, yeah. Then this is uh, illustration is misleading, therefore, that the level three is uh, somewhere very high. So the good guess would be on level six between H and B. That is the longest lead vector available and it is in the very accurately in the direction of y-axis. So let's have a look how these points on the level 6 look in real space. They are here, B and H. So this is the level 6 in this illustration. So between these two electrodes it is obtained the strongest signal of the Y component of the cardiac vector. Frank, however, did not select these because he wanted to have a good reproducibility in his lead system. And it is, the, they are somewhere here, the electrodes, but they are not so accurately easy to find what is the location. So he Instead of those, he selected A and I, which are not the ideal ones in the sense of lead vector, but they are the ideal ones in the sense of reproducibility. The A and I on the level 6 are here, so the lead vector of this lead is this one. So now is needed to some correction to be done here. And the lead vector should be in this orientation. And he used the electrode C, which is here, joined these points and uh, placed two resistors between A and C so that the ra ratio of the resistors is the ratio of these 
lengths and then in the middle having the electrode is the point small a prime in the image space. So now recording between this point and that point the lead vector is in the orientation of y axis and it is almost the longest possible. Reproducibility is obtained and also the left hand problem is uh, avoided because the electrode is on the side it doesn't matter whether the hand is touching the uh, side or not. I go to the C component next week. It is quarter to 12. So thank you very much.